Good afternoon and good morning. On behalf of myself, my partners, and the speakers who have so graciously taken their time to share their expertise today, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth session of the Tribal Nations Partnership, Building a Presence in E-Commerce webinar series. We hope through these sessions to increase American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian participation in the growing online marketplace for art and craft work. My name is Ken Van Way, and I'm a program specialist with the U.S. Department of the Interior's Indian Arts and Crafts Board. I'd like to recognize the hard work of my partners, Susan Anthony of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and Mark Thompson and Lynn Wilson of Indian Dispute Resolution Services Incorporated, a nonprofit organization whose ACORN project provides small business advice for Native American entrepreneurs. This project was launched last year in response to President Biden's executive order on economic relief related to the COVID-19 pandemic, in which he instructed federal agencies to prioritize activities that provide relief to individuals, families, and small businesses, as well as to state, local, and territorial and tribal governments. We would like to welcome back attendees from our earlier programs, as well as those logging in for the first time. If you missed the previous presentations, they are or will soon be available for viewing on the Patent and Trademark Office's YouTube page. Future presentations will occur from 3 to 5 Eastern Time on the second Thursday of each month, with the next session, Marketing Plans, scheduled for July 14, 2022. Future topics are listed on the registration page, but we welcome feedback, and if there are topics of interest that you would like us to cover, we will see if that is something we can accommodate. If you have any questions during the course of this event, we have opened the written chat and will do our best to accommodate those as well. With that said, I would like to welcome to the panelists for today's session, Pricing and Getting Paid. They are Mary Beth Timothy. She's an award-winning Cherokee artist from Muskogee, Oklahoma, specializing in Native American and wildlife art. Mary Beth and her husband operate Moonhawk Art LLC, an art business. She creates new original art and offers her and her husband's images on various items, such as ceramic decorative tiles, coffee mugs, cuff bracelets, and t-shirts. While Mary Beth sells pri primarily through venues such as gift shops, art markets, and powwows, she has been able to expand and reach a worldwide market through her Moonhawk Art Etsy store. <clears throat> Teresa Secord is a traditional Penobscot basket maker and the founding director of the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. During her 21 years of leadership, MIBA was credited with saving an endangered art of ash and sweetgrass basketry. Teresa has received a Lifetime Achievement Award for Artistic Excellence from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Prize for Creativity in Rural Life from the Women's World Summit Foundation at the UN for helping basket makers rise out of poverty. Teresa works with artists to help achieve their own goals of art and economic self-sufficiency through a long association with First Peoples Fund. She is a member of the governing board of Colby College Art Museum and a trustee at the Portland Art Museum of Art, Portland Museum of Art rather in Maine, where she continues to advocate for indigenous and underrepresented artists. Alaska Native artist Christy Ruby is a one woman show for her business, Sea Ruby Designs. She harvests her unique marine mammals to use for creative award-winning fur fashions. Working as a paid graphic designer since she was 16, she has taught, has taught her every small skill matters when developing your brand. And her difficult journey to success is a compelling story with many deep potholes and dead ends to overcome. On her website, under the category My Vision, you can learn more about Christy and see when life serves you mud pie, you should always make dirt bombs. Bud Johnson is a member of the ba Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians and has been learning traditional ways, tribal ways for most of his life. He has been carving pipestone and making pipes for over 20 years and currently teaches pipe making class and does tribal storytelling and inspirational talks. 
but is the founding and current elected president of the Keepers of the Sacred Tradition of Pipe Makers, a tribal nonprofit organization in Pipestone, Minnesota that was formed in 1996 by local Native Americans and tribal leaders to protect and to educate the public about the nearby Pipestone quarries. In addition to these cultural and educational functions, the keepers maintain a gallery, a shop, and online store to increase the visibility and availability of their members' work. <clears throat> this panel will be moderated by Lynn Wilson. Lynn serves as the Indian Dispute Resolution Services Microenterprise Development Specialist. She has championed small businesses and entrepreneurs for 16 years, working with tribal communities across Indian country, including her own tribe, the Cherokee Nation, where she continues to provide small business support services for the tribe's CDFI and Commerce Division. Lynn's work has focused on entrepreneurial training, business counseling, economic and demographic and social research related to economic development. Since 2009, she has taught part-time for the School of Business and Technology at Rogers State University and served as the lead certification trainer for her Indian Preneurship Journey curriculum while on staff at Onaben. Lynn received her MBA and professional certification in entrepreneurship from Cameron University and as a certified market research specialist through the National Center for Economic Gardening. Lynn, would you like to take that away? Sure. Yeah. I think my bio needs shortened down <laughs> quite a bit, actually. We'll do that uh, next but time. anyway, yeah. Thank, mine, thank mine you. Too. I'm not the important. I'm not the important one here. It's uh, these ladies and this nice gentleman that has joined us today that we're looking forward to talking with. So I appreciate all of you for being here with us. So. Um, I know we just gave kind of a little bit of an introduction, but if you don't mind, I would like to ask uh, each of you, starting with you, Bud, if you don't mind, since that's kind of the order I'm seeing things in, um, to talk to us a little bit more about yourself as an artist, you know, what kind of visual art that you create, um, whether your business is full-time or part-time, how long you've been producing and selling your art, and where you sell your art at. I'm not sure if Bud is hearing me. So, Teresa, I'm going to go ahead and ask, <laughs> ask you to start. Okay. Um, uh, everyone. Uh, Natalie Wiz, Tell Ed Secord. Bizina Dakad, uh, Bina Webskeg. Um, Teresa, Penobscot basket maker. I've been weaving traditional ash and sweetgrass baskets here for about 35 years. It's a long, uh, tradition. Of basketry in uh, the four uh, tribes here in Maine, the Maliseet, uh, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot. And um, I sell my work mostly in um, large jury national Indian art markets like the Heard Museum, Guild Indian Fair and Market in March, and coming up the Santa Fe Indian Market. And I also sell my work online. We used to have a number of local markets here in Maine, and there, there are some still, but a number went away during the pandemic, unfortunately. So I find myself, you know, mostly traveling to sell my work. Thank you, Teresa. Glad to have you mm -hmm. here. Christy. Thank you. Pleasure. Hi. My name is uh, Christy Ruby, and I'm an Alaska Native for fashion designer, and I'm um, I'm also the creator, first creator of Colored Sea Otter, so that entails a lot more work, but it's well worth it. Um, I'm an award-winning um, designer. I've been awarded for the last six years at Santa Fe Market and Church Yard Market, so I'm pretty proud of that part, especially because it's fur. I sell mainly online because travel is so expensive from Alaska. I do go to the shows when I can, but most of my sales are done online. So it's a lot of work being the one woman show, doing your advertising, your photographs, your, your actual work. So 
This year, though, I actually hired somebody to help me, so I'm totally excited and I can enjoy the summer a little bit and get some sunshine when it actually sunshines. So. That's, That's right, Christy. So is your business full? Do you do this full time or is this just part time for you? I would say it's three quarters time. So in between and it depends on if it's sunshine. Rainy days I work, sunny days I'm not. So and that's probably three quarters of the time it's raining because it, we live in Ketchikan and you know 176 inches a year. So most time I'm working. Okay, well, I'm glad you have some help there for your, yeah. for your business. <laughs> That's nice. Oh, uh, Mary Beth. Hello, uh, Mary Beth Timothy, Cherokee artist from Northeast Oklahoma. Uh, my husband and I, my husband's Muskogee Creek, and we're both artists. And we decided after we got married in 2015 to kind of take our art to a different level and we became Moonhawk Art LLC and bought equipment so that we could print our artwork onto different types of substrates. And I'm really glad we did that now because um, since the pandemic and we, you know, weren't able to travel and do shows like we were before, um, you know, we're able to do more online and um, I'm not a big gallery artist, I guess. I've I've tried that um, for a while, and it was, to me, just me personally, it was a, kind of a hassle. So I, I like doing things the way that we're doing it. Um, we went full-time. We were doing it part-time at first, and we went full-time, both of us, in 2018. And so now, you know, we... We were still traveling, doing shows until the pandemic. And then, of course, um, when that closed down, we started pushing our online um, a lot more and been doing a lot, a lot more online because we were just using it as a filler, you know. And so now, gosh, through Etsy, through Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, email, just it seems like everywhere. And we're also just recently um, got into the Made in Oklahoma website and became registered with them. So now we're even getting more and we do quite a bit of wholesale um, since the gift shops and the museums and galleries have opened back up. We sell a lot of our products wholesale to them. Um, so yeah, we... I don't, I don't know what else I need to talk about right now, but I don't want to just take up the whole time. <laughs> but, well, thanks. Because that, that was actually a good set. Okay. I was going to say, Leah knows. Obviously. I'll just talk all day. So. <laughs> I, know. I know you, Mary Beth. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that's a good segue into, you know, this, this whole series is really focused on helping Native artists either start selling by on e-commerce or expand their e-commerce presence. And so you mentioned that you sell on Etsy, you sell on Instagram, you sell on Facebook. You know, I know you have collectors that will even just, you know, reach out to you personally. Um, so that is fantastic. So I'm curious, um, and I'm sorry, I did not mean to overlook, but is Bud hearing me now? Because I know um, just a few minutes ago that he, that he, hear me bud can you hear me now yes <laughs> yes we can hear you now okay well let's circle back here to bud learn a little bit more about bud and then and then we'll pick back up good thank you so bud tell us a, a little bit more about yourself what kind of art is that you create um i i know they kind of mentioned it in your bio and how and how long um and where you sell your art at. Well, that was kind of a big deal. Like Mary Beth just said, getting out to some of the art shows is where you have to be to get your name out there to show people what you're doing. Uh, I started making pipes in 1984 and we formed our nonprofit organization in 1996. I got our website built and I've taken Native American dance groups all over the world France, Austria, Switzerland, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, 
and talked about pipes and pipestone, done craft classes in all these countries. And our sales is worldwide. Uh, I just sent some pipe blanks to Israel a couple of days ago. And uh, kind of amazing how tribal art is becoming so popular, but it's hard for so many artists to make enough product to be able to afford to go do an art show because a lot of them cost a lot of money. You know, you pay four or $5,000 to get a booth at an art show and you got one picture, you're kind of stuck. But uh, things like that, we really ought to look into making prints if we're gonna do art or making enough product so you can actually afford to go sit at an art show and talk to people. But that is a huge part of what we're trying to do here, I think. So if anybody's got any questions, we can try to answer them. Thank you, Bud. Okay, now we'll kind of circle back around and talk a little bit about your e-commerce component. So um, Bud, since you're live and on the big screen with me now, um, you know, Mary Beth mentioned that she sells on Etsy, on uh, Facebook, Instagram, so several different places online. So where where online do you do your business at? Is it all through your website or do you make use of a third party um, provider like Etsy? We've got Facebook pages all over the place. Stories on YouTube, besides our website that you can buy stuff on. And uh, just talking to people gets them to come to your website to buy things. Being active on Twitter and Facebook, I think are a big deal because people start looking for you. Put comments up there every day, put a picture up there every day, put a saying up there every day, something that inspires people to keep looking. Uh, on our one Facebook page, we get, I don't know, 12 to 15 people who share what I put up there every day with other people. So you're really truly contacting the world by doing that. Yes, thank you. And Christy, where do you sell your products online? Is it just through your website or um, do you use a multitude of platforms? I actually started with Etsy in the beginning in 2011. And then um, just a couple of maybe three years ago, I was deactivated because of the endangered nation or um, endangered element of the sea otter. So they deactivated all my merchandise that had sea otter seal in it, which is, well, the drag, but it's it's their company, so if they don't want to, you know, go to bed with the feds, that's okay, you know. So we get in trouble, and I don't blame them. But it it was a really good outlet for me to get my stuff out there in the beginning. So after that happened, I, I was actually forced to build a website uh, to actually sell. And I did a website in the beginning, cheap website, was simple, no part, no nothing, just a simple couple pages. To get myself out there because it's the first thing people ask do you have a website and i'm like not yet but i'm working on it so that that was the best thing i ever did was actually do the website and i am on every social media platform you can possibly think of i think the biggest thing is it would be nice to actually artists support other artists by sharing everything sharing their work with everybody on their own web page on their own page i mean you can get so much traction by somebody just sharing your work and we don't do enough of that to support each other you know we need to do more of that we need to have a platform that does nothing but share other artists work with other artists you know just something because it's you know we're unique the way we are and i think everybody needs to know that Sorry, did that answer your question? It did. It did, Christy. Thank you. 
Um, so Teresa, where do you sell your products online? Is it just through your website or do you also use social media or any other platforms? Uh, yes, it is primarily through my website and um, that was a site I developed through Artspan two years ago when Swaya, you know, who is the organization that puts on the Santa Fe Indian Market invited the juried artists to kind of go in together and get on this platform. And so we built our own little websites there and it's a, it's a very reasonable cost annually. I, I don't know, it, it was free for the first year. It might be like as low as a hundred and something dollars a year to host. And, um, and then I've, I use, I do use social media, social media to drive people to my website when I have something for sale. So everybody has already said like, all the things I wanted to say, like inventory is a big issue. It's a balancing act to try to, you know, go to a market, hopefully sell out, then, you know, put new work, you know, on your website and let people know, you know, you're going to be at the next place. And so it's just a kind and I, and I love what uh, Christy just said too um, about sharing other artists posts and yeah, if we had time and everything, that'd be great. But it is so important to try to lift each other up. That's, you know, that's huge and really would be great. It is. Thank you, Teresa. So today we're really focusing on pricing, which as artists, you know how difficult that is. Um, I think pricing is kind of a hard issue for any business, but I think when it comes to to art, um, there's just a whole lot of factors um, and things that you have to consider. And I don't think that there's any one pricing model that is right for, for any person. So um, don't feel that when we talk about pricing today that, you know, that you feel like you have to have the right answer or be the expert. You know, the great thing is, is people are just here to know what is it that you guys personally do? And I think it'll make people feel better understanding that that it's a challenge, uh, even for seasoned pros like you. So with that, um, Teresa, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and start with you. What factors do you consider when charging for a piece of art? Well, it's definitely been a 35 year journey, you know, trying to figure out how to price your work. And, um, you know, there was something that I shared with you earlier that that I, I learned quite a bit from when I worked with First People's Fund, and I, I still do some some work with emerging artists there. And they talk about these different pricing methods, um, which there are about six there. And I can share in the chat to a link to some of the First People's Fund resource webinars that help emerging artists with marketing and pricing and things. But um, I would say I use a combination of methods. You know, I try to figure out like what my income is and, and how much more I might need, you know, from a different show, you know, obviously want to break even in, you know, earn a profit, um, you know, trying to figure out special, you know, pricing for larger pieces, something unique that I spent a lot of time on. And then um, you do price yourselves, you know, among your, um, other artists in the same genre. So we kind of have that figured out as the few basket makers in the markets together, we, we kind of look around and see what others are gaining. And so I think it's called like, you know, the market driven method to see how much the market can bear. And then I, I will share an example. I was just in the Heard Museum um, Guild Indian Fair and Market in Phoenix in March. And I thought, well, you know, inflation and all was starting and I should, raise my prices, you know, and um, that wasn't entirely successful. I think I, I brought home some pieces that I, I would have sold if I hadn't priced them a little bit high. So there's always that trial and error thing out there. And Christy, what are your thoughts on that? And, uh, and what things do you take into consideration when you're trying to price one of your, one of your products? I've noticed that when I've been on both sides of the spectrum, um, as far as low pricing and high pricing, the biggest thing I've noticed is that people keep telling me I'm too cheap. You need to raise your prices. And when I do, I get bumped into a different category of people that buy. It's usually the people that can afford it 
and you just look at it and go, I want that. They don't know what it is. They don't know that it's a sea otter. They think it's a beaver. They don't have no idea what I've done with it. They just like it and buy it. So there's kind of a less appreciation for the item when it, when you just have so much money, you can buy whatever you want. So yeah, I get the sale, sure, but there's no feeling in it and there's no appreciation. So I have a tendency to price my stuff lower than normal. But when I do price it higher, I feel guilty for ripping off the public. So I know that there's a there's this, there's high and low. So usually what I do is I go in between. I only bump up stuff five dollars a year to see how it goes. You know, raise it up just a little bit, not a lot. And and I know you're supposed to think artists are have a self worth that you're worth this much, but you're only worth what somebody will pay for. So I just go by, what do you think is a fair deal for this? You know, what do you think is a good price? I ask my customers also, what would you be willing to pay for this? It goes a long way. Thank you, Christy. Mary Beth, what are, what are your thoughts? What factors do you consider? You know, whether it's the time to make, the cost of the materials, um, and I, you know, I even know for you, your your reputation has really increased over the past few years. Um, I would kind of mimic both um, what they said. Um, and I also did the First People's Fund training and those, those pricing formulas that they teach us are, are fantastic because everybody's so different and all over the board on how they need to price their work. Um, so yeah, if, if you have trouble with that, I would follow her lead on, on her sending those links. But, um, I would say I, that we use that combination method as well. You know, we, of course, you know, have to cover our expenses and, um, it depends on how much time I put into a piece, the medium, you know, the, if it's something that is similar to, you know, maybe a competitive artist out there that, that shows um, at the same shows. It depends on, you know, your audience. It, it depends on so many different factors. So, um, yeah, and with everything going up, I, I've noticed that a lot of our supplies and everything have been going up. So that's something I've had a hard time doing and I probably haven't gone up on a lot of our um, pieces in a long time. So I need to, I need to do that. So my advice is to yeah, do that, I, even I would, though I haven't done it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you haven't done it. Teresa, I know you said that you did try to price up a little bit just because of the inflation of everything um, and and that it worked out for you so well at that market. Um, so Christy or Bud, did have either of you adjusted your prices in correlation with the inflation that we're experiencing right now? Yeah, Christy, go ahead. And you're, you're muted, I think. Sorry, I was muted. I was somebody came inside. I needed to sidetrack. So, um, no, I I haven't up everything. I've only upped very few things that are high end products. You know that it cost me a lot more to ship the actual hides from the tannery. The tannery costs have gone up, so I have to compensate. I have to be able to make what I need to make. So I can't help the fact that, you know, it costs me more to produce. But um, people don't seem to mind. I don't do a lot of um, pricing uh, increase, like 20 bucks. So that's not a big deal. And uh, also mailing costs so much more now. I mean, it's almost uh, gone up 20% for mailing products now. So that's, you know, I think, I think we need more, uh, better payments for jobs and stuff. And people need to make more money. Are we still at a $12 minimum wage fee or something? I mean, what's going on there? So. Right. Right, yeah. Um, 
when you are on minimum wage, I don't know that that's that's necessarily a living wage and um, it, it's very, very difficult. But uh, and then with the current inflation, it just <laughs> things have just gotten just gotten a little bit crazy. It's definitely changed changed my lifestyle for me and my family for sure. But um, thank you. OK, so let me take a look here at my notes and and see where we're at. Um, so let's talk a little bit about competitors and, you know, are your competitors charging similar to you? Um, and do they seem to say, stay consistent with their pricing? So what are you noticing others that are, and I hate to use the word competitors for some reason in Indian country, that's just, it, that's never really the right to me, the right term to use, but. <laughs> um, Hello artists. Fellow artist, yes. Thank you. My, my well, Christy, since you're up, we'll just let you go ahead. <laughs> my my fellow artists are. I have some that are less expensive than me, only because they want to sell, so they price their stuff cheaper, so then they can get the sales that I would not get. And we're a very small group of people, you know, for CR, so and CL and products. So, and then another person. Uh, sells their stuff for astronomical prices and you know they still get it though so i'm just in between i like to stay in between and that's that's a more comfortable place and i like to be fair to my customer so and i give out freebies oh i like freebies <laughs> All right, uh, Bud. What what about? Um, let's go to you, you and and how do you how are your uh, fellow artists charging compared to you and and do you, they seem to be staying consistent with their pricing? So I'm going to ask uh, our Kia or somebody that you might just give Bud a call and and see if you could help walking through any technical difficulties he might be having. Um, so, Teresa, you actually mentioned a minute ago that that all of you, at least up in your area, you guys are all kind of coinciding on, on your pricing and there's not a whole lot of deviation. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's that's mostly correct. Um, we had a 20 year history of um, lifting up this next generation of basket makers. And so we were all marketing together. We sent um, the next, the younger basket makers out to sell in the Indian markets about 10 years ago. And so, um, and, and that's also very traditional. The people here in Maine have been selling baskets for 200 continuous years. And so uh, that's very traditional for us. And it was interesting when I first started selling my work, I, um, the elders, the mentors, actually, my mentor set my prices for me. And so then we had this young generation of basket makers like Jeremy Frey, who's Pasmo Quadi, who's won the best of show at Santa Fe before. And um, just, you know, weaves remarkable pieces. He and others like Sarah Sock Beeson, um, a young Penobscot basket maker, came along and they really innovated the art form. And so you know, I still weave baskets that are somewhat traditional looking, almost like based on this Victorian tradition, the baskets that my great grandmother wove because I'm using her same wooden forms and pieces. And so I think I think my prices are still lower, um, but also these younger, more innovative basket makers spend a lot more time on their art too. And they, they've raised the art form to a really high level. And so when they first started selling, it was really interesting because the elders in the group, most of whom are gone now, um, you know, they were really taken aback because that was never done before where a student or a younger, um, you know, the English term would be apprentice or gekimsu student would charge higher than their teacher. That, that wouldn't have been done in the past. But for this next new generation, these younger basket makers to be able to make a living, even part-time, they had to. Because you're, you're starting with cutting it down a tree in the um, boreal forest of Maine, you know, to release this wood splints from that tree to weave these baskets is extraordinary. You know, I can relate to 
Christy's saying, it's an extraordinary amount of work, you know, in with, beginning with the raw materials, et cetera. So it's kind of an interesting, it's been an interesting journey with that, with the um, pricing. But we do kind of stay together in our pricing, it seems like to me. You know, when someone else raises their prices, so do I. <laughs> Uh, and Mary Beth, how is how is it for you and and the other fellow artists that are selling items that are similar in nature to yours? Yeah, I noticed. I as soon as I said competitive, I was like, yeah, that wasn't right. But so I apologize for saying that. But fellow artists, um, you know, I've noticed it's kind of all over the board with painters and you know people that do the two D. It seems like. There, there's been a few that I've even sat with and had discussions and told them, you need to raise your prices. You're making the rest of us look really bad. <laughs> so, you know, the, there's some artists that they're just, you know, they'll do amazing work and they'll just put a minimum price on it so they can pay the rent. You know what I mean? That, that type of break even type thing. Um, but, you know, like, I can't remember which, which one said it, but, you know, you have to have that self-worth and, um, yeah, you just have to get out there and market yourself and, and don't, don't hide. It's so hard for some artists. I mean, like John, my husband, he's such an introvert, you know, it's really hard for him to sell himself, but that's part of it whenever, you are doing something where you're having a business and and selling your art you're selling yourself um, not just your images right so yeah you have to have that that self-worth and and realize um you know you're creating something from inside you you know it's not something that they can just run to walmart and get it's it's a one of a kind it's I don't know. It's one one of my biggest things about doing art is to, you know, create some kind of an emotion in someone, whether, you know, they see it and it sparks a memory from childhood or or they see it and they think it's funny or, you know, whatever, then, you know, those that all adds into to the worth of the piece, right? So it's there's just so much. And I try to explain that <laughs> to, to different fellow artists. And so some, some listen, some don't, but, but yeah, it's, it's crazy how all over the place it is. And some people, you know, if they win a couple of awards and then they're, they get a little bit of a, um, I don't know, it kind of balloons their head a little bit and, and <laughs> they feel like, and, okay, let me let me change it to say when I worked at the Five Civilized Tribes Museum in Muskogee here, and we have a student art show. And so every year we tell the teachers, okay, you know, they can enter up to like three pieces in this show, but at least one of those pieces has to be for sale. So for years, I collected the student art show baskets. I've got a whole collection of them and I love them. But then all of a sudden, one year, these kids were charging like $300 for these little baskets. And I was like, wait a minute, what, what's going on? And the teacher had told the kids, if you don't want to sell them, then just put a high price on them. And we had already told them not to do that. You know, you can't do that. And, and that's something people shouldn't do. But, but I also told them, you know, and, and think about this, if, a child puts, or any artist, puts a major high price on something, right? And they're just starting out. And somebody in their family or a family friend or something like that pays for that. And then what does that do to them? Boy, that just gives them all this confidence and makes them feel really good, which is what the parent or the family member or friend wants to do. But it kind of inflates them to think, well, I'm worth that, you know, <laughs> and when they need to kind of start slow and build up to that. And so then I think that just ends up causing major disappointment 
in the long run because they're they're starting up here instead of building up to it. Does that make sense? It does. But you know, as an artist, as you do grow and your reputation <clears throat> uh, expands and you have more achievements, you know, I, I would expect that that should, you know, we do need to be, you do need to be proud of yourself. You, you know, it's okay sometimes to have a big head. Yeah. Um, it's hard for has, a lot of us though. It's really hard. I know it is. And I, I know you very personally, so I know it's extremely hard for you, but I also know how much you have grown as an artist over the past few years. And I'm curious, has your reputations and achievements as an artist, have they grown, as they've grown, how that has affected your pricing? Um, my originals have gone up, actually. I will say my originals have gone up a bit. I won't say tremendously, but but they have gone up and um, and that a lot of that is due to a particular gallery owner that um, kind of buttonholed me about my prices and, you know, and, you know, one of my big things that I always had bragged about that the reason that we do our business end of it, where we print the images on different items is so that you know, people from all walks of life can have art in their homes instead of just big time collectors, right? You know, just because we don't have a lot of money doesn't mean we don't deserve to have art in our homes, right? So that's kind of been our little motto thing about doing our business was trying to, you know, get art into into homes that couldn't necessarily afford to have big things, but, I do realize, you know, I have been doing this for a long time, you know, gosh, what, almost 30 years now and and won awards and been published and been, you know, showing all around and in Europe. And so, yeah, when I stop and think about all these things and I think, okay, so I guess I should charge a little more now. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's just hard for some of us. And it's easier for me to tell others how to do it and what to do. Then it's kind of like, you know, personal stuff. It's easier to, to fix other people's problems than to work on your own, you know? So, yeah, it's kind of like that with being pricing. Well, Lisa, how about you over the years uh, as you've grown with your achievements and reputation and as, as an artist, that affected the pricing? model for you? Yeah, it definitely has helped with, you know, different, you know, with recognition over time. And I think it's important too to be, you know, consistent in the markets, like continuing to show up, you know, even <laughs> after a bad market, you know, you still want to continue to show up for the collectors and things. Um, you know, and then we're fortunate in that this is a relatively small um, number of people practicing traditional basketry. And so that's the sad, sad part, you know, it's like a lot of the elders are, are gone and not a lot of people are practicing this art form and getting out into the markets fewer than when I first started even. And so, um, you know, the collectors want to collect from, from each of us. So I'm just in a very fortunate place in my career and in the markets right now, I think. Right. And Christy, you mentioned that you've received a lot of achievements uh, lately. And have you taken that into consideration when pricing your work? Um, only for the large pieces, you know, the extremely difficult, uh, time consuming large pieces. But what I've noticed is I actually sell the two stores um, consignment. And what I like about doing that is that it gets exposure and I keep I keep uh, items on in stock that are like these little purses that I make, you know, they're small, they're $45, they're under the $50 mark. And what that does is it gets my name out there. My name is in the purse. I have a tag that goes with it and it gets my name. That person that bought that might want a hat someday. So 
it's like the little business card. It's advertising. So if you can sell something really small for inexpensive, like the ACE, I used to sell ACEOs, uh, artist original collection, collectors and editions, little paintings, miniature paintings. They're single paintings. I paint too, but it's it's too hard to paint. So, um, but you sell these paintings for like hundred dollars, and it's got your name on and everything, and they, and they lift you up later on and say, hey, you know, maybe I want to buy a big painting later, or maybe I want to big buy a hat, you know, because I really like this purse that I got. So always watch out for the little stuff. That's the big thing. Thank you, Christy. And I'm going to circle around back to Bud just to see. Bud, can you can you hear me? And are you able to? To respond. Who are you talking to? You. You. <laughs> so I was. We were just talking about uh, pricing, but and I was wondering if you know, as you've grown as an artist over the years, has that affected how much you charge for your products? Oh, for sure. I figure out what I think I'm worth per hour, and then how many hours it took to make something. And I put that on the price. So you're lucky if you get ten bucks an hour. And if you if you start off at ten dollars an hour, you find out you're not making any money. Yep. Yeah. And plus your materials, and it just gets really difficult. Uh, many people today are making fifteen to twenty dollars an hour in a regular job. And if you like doing your artwork and you stick a $20 an hour price tag on making a painting or making a pipe, and all of a sudden you've got a five or $600 item going there, and the public says, oh, no, I'm not going to pay that kind of money for that. And the only way you can get ahead, if you can, is trying to make prints or copies but with what we do, that doesn't work. You know, my wife does a lot of craft. She's much more artistic than I am. She does paintings and she does pine needle baskets and she can make leather clothing for you and all that. But the same situation comes up. You start putting how many hours you put into putting that together and it starts pricing it right out of the market unless you're just going to sit there and wait for the right person to come along. And that makes it pretty hard. Well, I'm going to head out. I got. So let's talk about, um, you know, many of you are selling in different places, you know, whether it's at art markets and online uh, through Etsy, through social media, do you charge differently depending on where you're selling? So, you know, if you're at uh, Swaya, you know, is your prices going to possibly be different than if you are going to a, a different kind of show or whether you're at a powwow? Do you sell price your stuff differently when you are selling online? Because obviously when you're selling online, you have really opened it up to a worldwide market then um, versus, you know, being stuck in a physical location. So, Christy, uh, you're the first one I see. So I'm going to start with you on that one. Okay, um, I do stuff a little bit differently than most people when it comes to galleries and consignment. I actually price everything on the web is straight across the board, every price anywhere. So if I sell a purse for $45 at a gift store, I take the cut on the commission price. That gift store will stay keep that price at $45 for me and then they can upsell me to somebody else, you know, they can recommend my website, especially the QR codes, you know, you just click on the QR code and there's my website pops up. Um, you can go to my website and if they want it in a different color, they can order it in a different color. And then what I do is I usually find out where they found, uh, where they bought the purse or where they got the information and then I kick back 10% of their sale back to the actual gal the gallery for advertising. So it's completely different, but 
that person that looks at on my website will see that the price that they're paying in the gallery is going to be the same as on my website. So there's no cheating, no nothing, no extra special deals. It's just straight across. And that gallery owner gets the feeling of, yeah, well, if you go to a website, it's the same cost. So don't feel bad about looking over up and buying more stuff from her. So I operate a little bit differently than most gallery and consignment people. But I find out this works really good because he can return all the merchandise back at the end of the year. He's not responsible for any money. He's just responsible for keeping track of the inventory. And I can refresh the following year with new stuff. And it just it just cuts out a lot of headache for the customer thinking, well, I can probably get a better deal online. It's cheaper if I go to our website. Nope, it's all the same across the board. So what you see at the markets, what you see everything, if you go to a website, the price of what it is is what it is everywhere. No, you know, up or down. So that's how I do it. And it's worked great for me. Gotcha. And Mary Beth, how about you? Because I, I you know, I, and I also know, you know, like through selling on Etsy, you've got shipping costs. And then there's, of course, you know, some fees that Etsy has, like some marketing fees and stuff. So does selling online affect the price that you have to charge versus selling in person? Yeah, what we usually do um, for something like that um, is if we do shows, and this is strictly for the products, the printed products, not originals, but um, we'll do like a show special to where, you know, like the coffee mugs will be a little bit cheaper or something like that. Um, and so they'll think they're getting a really good deal <laughs> by doing it. Um, but actually, it's just taking the cost off of what we would have to pay, you know, to be online. Um, but on, on, you know, setting your prices different for different locations, what we've just learned to do is you just have to, after a while, learn your audience and so say if we're going to go set up at a powwow then we don't take our entire setup and have all our large originals and things like that you know we'll take our lower end pieces and t-shirts and you know tiles coffee mugs things like that but of course if you're going to go to swaya then you take you know your panels and all of your big originals and i remember the first time i did um santa fe market um I had no idea, no idea. I took just a mixture of, you know, little small pieces and big pieces and everything. And I thought it was really funny because nobody even really paid attention to the smaller, lower priced items. They just grabbed the big ones and it just, I don't know, it just shocked me. Um, and like they were saying about people that that buy, I think Christy was saying it about um, spending a lot of money on things and just because they like how it looks. And I actually did have a large piece that it had a lot of meaning to it, had a lot of colors, had just, I don't know, it just had every little component to it had some kind of meaning. And I love that, you know, whenever I have a piece that instigates conversation, right? And so I was anxious for somebody to pick out this one piece. And <laughs> this guy that came up and he looked at it and, and he wanted to know how much it was. And I told him, he said, okay, I'll take it. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, well, let me tell you about it. And he's like, no, you don't have to tell me nothing about it. It's got all the colors. My wife will like it. I want it. And I was like, Ah, you know, it's like, I almost, it's like, you just almost want to say, no, I, I don't want to adopt this one out to you. <laughs> you know? It's like sending a puppy to a no, 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 no. I don't think you'll take care of it. Right. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, that's rough to me too. Whenever somebody just snatches it up. Oh, well, it's got lots of colors. So, but yeah, I just, we've just learned that both of us that we just have to know our audience on what we take. I don't, we don't necessarily change our prices for the different venues. We just take different items to those venues to fit the audience. So, yeah. Trace, I have to come around back around to you as well. It's just very interesting uh, to me to, 
to hear all of this from from each of you on on the pricing. I really thought someone was going to say, oh, yes, online, I definitely charge more. So I've been a little bit surprised so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for me, I do I do try to be consistent because, you know, you never know when that collector might show up at another show and say, oh, wow, I have something really similar in size and scale to this and how come, you know, I paid more. And so that's something you have to be, you know, that that can happen as, and, and also online. But one thing I find interesting, too, is like um, adding the sales tax. So that's one thing we talk about in the first people's fund trainings is knowing what the sales tax is, say, in Arizona, for example, it's it's approaching and same with Santa Fe, it's approaching 9%. And so, you know, you either have to raise your price to absorb that almost 10%, you know, into the cost of the item or add that on. And you can see the horror in some of the <laughs> collectors' faces, you know, when they're buying that piece, like, oh, my God, you know, I didn't expect I was going to have to pay, you know, that. And so that's kind of interesting and try to educate buyers, you know, that this the same thing you do in a gallery. And and also like on day two of the markets, people try to talk you down and, you know, it's 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 important to hold firm because again, you could not do that if your work was in a gallery. You know, you, you really are not gonna do a lot of bargaining there, you know, for the higher end pieces of art. Um, and then it was interesting, I was next to an artist for probably about 10 years in the Santa Fe Indian market, Pablita Abeda. She's from a really well-known family and she crafted these really beautiful um, like terracotta dolls, statuette dolls that she made. And never on day one would you see the smaller pieces. And on day two, she would have all these really cool, like small pieces and affordable pieces because on Sundays, you pretty much know that those are gonna be the tire kickers, like the serious buyers, usually in the higher end markets on the very first day. And so she didn't even bother to have those pieces out you know, because she was focused on selling the larger pieces. So that's kind of an interesting strategy. I, I can't say I have enough inventory to do that myself, but um, yeah, trying to diversify, you know, your your pieces like Mary Beth, you know, and Christy were saying, you know, so having smaller pieces to share, you know, those other available price points. It's a good idea. So I'm going to open this up to just anybody who has a, an opinion on it, because I think about, <clears throat> you know, I see so many Native artists, um, you know, selling within their own community. And I, and I always think, wow, the, you know, that is worth so much more. I can see what time, you know, you've put into it. But of course, I understand that when you're selling um work and there's other people you know a, a lot of other fellow artists that are doing the same thing it does drive the price down so what would you tell these people about you know selling online because again to me selling online you know is focused on really a different market not that people from your community couldn't buy that from you online but really you've just opened the, and expanded the market so how do you think about adjusting your price um, you know, especially for those that may, you know, they just may not be pricing very high because because their current market, their region where they're at just won't bear it, but others were, will. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> you come, you went kind of out there. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, well, I did. I just, I, I guess, I'm just wondering what what advice you would give give to somebody that maybe they're not selling anywhere online. They've just been selling locally, you know, in their own market, and and maybe there are customers out there that that are willing to pay more than what they're able to get. I, I would that... say, I would say, sit down and put pencil to paper. And add up, ev I mean, you need to add up everything. Like, okay, so like with us, if we um, have a painting that we did, you know, so how much we would normally charge for that painting. 
and then you're going to package that up and you're you know most of these like etsy places like that have to where you can add the shipping at the end right um and you can do the taxes in it however you want to do that but you know you have to consider all of your you know if you're going to be printing out other things you've got ink you've got paper you've got packaging you've got tape you you know all of these things you need to sit down and you need to add them up or if it's our printed items you know we've got the tile we've got the the shipping that we had to order you know buy the tiles we have the backs we have the glue we have the packaging for each one we have stickers for the back you know we order thank you cards we have business cards in all of them cellophane sleeves all of these different things you know you have to consider all that and you want to make sure that you are covered and make something you don't want to break even on everything you're not going to stay in business so you know you want to cover yourself and make at least a little bit of money on everything that you're selling online and you made a very good point mary beth because when you're selling online you will have additional costs right it's not just the shipping cost and time it's the packaging you know, it's all those little extra things that you have to put into a product when it's being shipped that you need to make sure that you're um, ac accounting for. I, I think though, so. Lynn, I just wanted to ask, um, maybe direct it, not taking over your webinar, but direct that to Christy sure. and say, how did you, how and when did you decide to make that leap to Etsy? Because maybe that's kind of what you're asking is, you know, how does a community artist, you know, someone who's selling within their community cultural area make that leap? Because for me, it was like a long time to get online, but it seemed really courageous um, that um, she did it, you know, on Etsy like 10 years ago, you said? Yeah, I actually did it for 10 years. I was on there since 2011 and just recently they kicked me off but um because of the endangered species act so but um i actually did etsy in the beginning when it was a little bit more simpler platform they've gotten more confusing and more convoluted with their shipping costs and all that stuff and you know when something's you know not broke they still try to fix it so you got to try to find all the new links and all that but i started with etsy because it, it's the most simplest to use in the beginning and it's the simplest to get your name out there. Plus, they have reviews. If you do a really great job, you get a five-star review. That's like gold. You want to get those reviews. You want to tell your story. You, you need to tell your story. We are unique people. We're not your average, you know, high market, um, you know, corporate stuff. So when you get it, it's personal. So I, Etsy was the easiest platform to do. There's other now platforms you can use like um, Big Cartel, you know, GoDaddy has some simpler website tools and uh, you can use those and anybody can sell their work, but it takes a lot of time to do it if you're doing it yourself. But Etsy was the easiest for me to get on and start getting my name out there. Thank you, Christy. And you brought up another good point. So this uh, just takes us a little bit off the topic of pricing, because while we're talking about selling online on these different platforms like Etsy, um, you know, you just pointed out that when you're selling stuff yourself, it takes a lot of time. And Mary Beth, I know you actually teach a class called Etsy Entrepreneurship. Um, so can you talk about some of the pros that you explain to people who take your class about selling on Etsy, especially the marketing part of it? And, you know, I know there are some some downsides to Etsy, right? You know, we talked, yeah. as Christy was just saying, you know, it's there's, you know, maybe some some uh, fees or, you know, ways they do things. But how do you feel um, on the positive side of using these third party marketplace platforms? So on the positive side, um, I think like like Christy was saying, Etsy is one of the easiest ones to to get on to. And and, you know, anybody that's watching this, that's interested in doing that and needs help with it. Are you got, are y'all going to have our contact information on here? I, don't know. I know your contact information was on the event website. 
Okay. Okay. So, you know, feel free to reach out, but, um, I, I feel like, you know, okay. So we had just a regular website, just a cheap, easy peasy website. And we were hardly ever getting any orders on it at all. I mean, like 1 or 2 a year. So most of our sales were in person or on Facebook at that time. And then whenever I think it was a grant with you guys um, with IDRS that um, we got help getting a new website built and um, one of your employees there had reached out to me and said, hey, have you ever thought about trying Etsy? And at that point, honestly, I'd never even heard of it because I, at that time, I had never even shopped online. I wasn't a big, you know, putting my credit card out there in the world type person. Of course, now I think everybody in the world has my credit card number. But um, so I thought I would try it once we did that. Then that just, to me, it, it opened up a whole new world because, you know, when people go to just a website, it's, like they have to be driven there by word of mouth or you know they see you at a show or something like that but like with etsy it already has its audience you know there's people that automatically buy from etsy go in there strictly to look for you know art or handcrafted items most generally i know now they have other things but you know, so so you've got this worldwide audience already there. And, you know, talking about the fees and everything, what I usually tell people, yes, they do have fees. And some people, when they're trying to sit and figure up all these little fees and stuff, I say, okay, think of it this way. This is how I look at it, is if I had a brick and mortar store, okay, I've got to pay my lease on that. I've got to pay the utilities on that and then i have to hope that somebody comes in and buys from me there right and you have to show up you have to be there with the doors open in order to sell something so with these online platforms it's a 24 7 you know every day of the year you can do it from anywhere that you're at as long as you have a smartphone you can do it in your pajamas i'm you know you can take orders anytime you want to you can put it in vacation mode if you're going to be gone for a while make sure you do that by the way if you're going to be away from where you <laughs> do your ordering from um but it it's just i don't know it's worth those little fees to me to be able to have my business from home and to be able to do it however whenever i want to you know yeah and if you would if I, if I asked you kind of as a ballpark figure on percentages what percent of people that buy from you through etsy are, are people that you've made personal contact with and how many are just people you never would have reached otherwise I'd say less than 10% are from people that we know. Everybody else is just from everywhere. And we, like yesterday, we got four orders. One was from Nova Scotia. One was from Kansas. One was from New York. And one was from Missouri. So, you know, it's just random, crazy out there stuff and you know it depends on what keywords you put in you know what people are looking for so it's but you know and like i tell students that are taking my workshop is you're going to get out of it what you put into it whether it's sitting and working on it for 10 minutes a day or you know trying to do it as a full-time job and working on it all day long but you know you just one of those things you got to work it if you want to make money just like if you had a brick and mortar only you can do it in your pajamas yeah well i love that thank you for sharing the story and and i actually remember when mary beth made her first international sale through etsy <laughs> so that was kind of a, uh, that was a kind of an exciting exciting moment for that her, snoopy so. dance thing 
<laughs> yeah. I think it was from France or someplace, wasn't it? I don't know, France or Australia. <laughs> oh, um, okay. Um, but I'm actually going to start with you this time, if you could get yourself unmuted and ready. Um, so if you notice that there's an artist selling a product that's very similar to yours at a radically different price, and that could either be higher or lower, how do you handle that situation? Do you adjust your pricing to match? Um, or, you know, does your reaction depend on maybe who the artist is? And if I need to clarify, just just let me know. No, I don't pay any attention to what somebody else sells something for because they don't have what I have. And uh, we've built such a worldwide base of people who are looking for what we put together here, either my stuff or my wife's stuff or my brother-in-law's stuff. They actually ask for it my name and they don't seem to care what it costs. They're much more concerned about who made it. You know, did you make it or can you make it? And when will you get it done? And we're so far behind on orders. We tell everybody it could take up to two months to get something done. So we don't care much about the competition. We've got a pretty big reputation. If you look on any of the sites like TripAdvisor, we got like a five star rating with the stuff that we do. And customers constantly are putting comments in on Facebook and Twitter and say, wow, you ought to go here. You ought to see what they're doing. They can help you make a pipe or they can help you make a necklace or they can help you make a basket. So we don't worry about the competition at all. Uh, even when I was doing art shows, I did the grand opening for the Smithsonian in New York many, many years ago. And the Smithsonian was so impressed with what we did. They gave me back the $6,000 I paid for the booth. Nice. So you know you're in a pretty good spot. So I'm just going to open that question up to you ladies if if you guys have something that you that you want to say on that i know this we were kind of talking before the webinar started um susan was in the room talking with us saying you know when she was um at res you know she was talking to someone that had bought rings and, and there was two of them selling something very similar but the prices were radically different so you know how do you guys handle that if, if you run into that situation personally I would like oh, to say I, something real quick um, about that. When she had mentioned that, like, say, if somebody was at a, a market, you know, and um, they see a pair of earrings and it's like six or $125, and then they see the same or very similar at another booth for like $65. And, and I've noticed during our Etsy classes, whenever I've been showing, um, the students different keywords and stuff and so we'll go in and i'll share my screen and we'll go into different etsy shops and look at how they advertise and things and so one thing that i've noticed there's been some earrings that looked exactly alike but then when you go into um and read the descriptions some of them might be like nickel you know hoops or something like that but then the other ones are like platinum or sterling silver you know it it might have different um elements to it that would cause that price to go up so i think that you know it's important if your pieces have special um well just like um um teresa was talking about you know, all the work that goes into to those baskets from cutting down the tree. You know, these are things that you need to share with the customer that um, all these different elements in your pieces, that's what sets you apart. That's what makes it worth more is, are different things like that. You gotta be good to tell a story, right? Yeah, gotta be a talker for me. 
I, I was going to share that um, I definitely will pay attention if somebody is, you know, pricing radically different, you know, I want to try to figure out why. And then, um, you know, is it a skill level difference or like, you know, as Mary Beth is pointing out, is there materials quality different? So I do try to distinguish my own baskets and yeah, I, I think I, I, I shared, I weave my baskets on wooden forms that have been handed down in my family from the 1800s from my great grandmother. And so that, you know, distinguishes, I think. And, um, you know, I try to be original in my work. That's another thing that, that we notice sometimes the basket makers are copying each other and that's not a good thing. And, you know, we'll let them know. And um, so trying to stay true to your own values and, and pricing system and, you know, trying to, keep from getting distracted. And um, and I will share back to what happened to me at the herd market with my pricing was, I really was, you know, pricing high with the inflation and everything, but um, there was really only so many people walking around for those higher end pieces, you know? And so if your competitors are there and they're priced similarly, you know, there's a good possibility they're gonna find your friend first, you know, and then they're not gonna, spring for another basket in that price range, especially from the same tribe. They're like, okay, I got my Penobscot basket this year. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to think about and observe when you're seeing your friends, you know, and, and what they're doing. So Teresa, you were taught saying a minute ago, you know, that sometimes, you know, maybe people copying the style or something of, of another basket maker and that that's no good to do. And I'm curious, is have they, any of the rest of you, have you had any issues with other artists copying something that maybe you feel is really kind of proprietary to to you and how you do your work? Go ahead, Christy. I actually have people that do, you know, imitation. It's the highest form of quality, you know, flattery, but it's really not. Um, they do try to copy what I do, but my biggest issue is I'm actually, uh, it took me four years to come up with colored sea otter, and it took me a while to get the process, and the tannery didn't exist, and now it does, and it took me a while and a lot of trial and error to ruin hides and stuff to get a tannery to even get a federal permit to tan sea otter, and then let alone color it. So, and the customers see that when you, when you work hard and see your work and stuff. They, they know you put a lot into it. And that's going to make you stand out more than anybody else. You know, because that's, that's what you have to do. You have to really work hard. Yeah, and I do believe in one of the future webinars, we do talk about things like creating your art. It is very difficult for an artist to um, protect what they feel is, is proprietary to them. It, it takes a lot of money to um, you know, to fight somebody who may be copying your work. I'm not starving, but, you know, I, I do have to pay for a lot of uh, bullets and gas and boats and, you know, to go get my animals and I got to flush them, skin them, have them tan, send it off, ship it off, got it tanned, have it colored, and then have it shipped back. Then I got to make something out of it. So I, I guess from the ocean to the your head, it's a long process. I think it's scary that um, so many, what I'm finding is the, the foreign companies will steal 2D art so quickly and, you know, then they're printing it on t-shirts and blankets and all this kind of stuff. And then retailers in the U.S. are buying it and selling it to the public. And I see them on Facebook all the time, you know, and so then we all have to like gang up on these companies to where they have to cease and desist. And, and just this year, um, I saw one of my images on, on, um, t-shirts and, and, um, sweatshirts and things. So, you know, we, we did it. We all ganged up on them until they, as far as I know, I don't know that, but I went to, you know, it's like you have to go to each one and you finally get to the source 
and you know let them know and prove that you are the original artist for that and and they pulled their ads at least off of social media so i don't know if they're anywhere else but but who knows how many they sold before we caught that so so yeah it's it's kind of crazy out there how and that's where you know that pricing they can come in and and sell stuff for so cheap so yeah, like you said, though, being a, a native artist, a good thing about the native artist community is the uh, supporting one another, looking out for one another. You know, I know you've noticed another fellow artist work being copied and brought it to their oh, attention. Yeah. So. yeah, and I know we've had students say, well, does Etsy, you know, do these platforms, um, do they police that? And I said, no, we as native artists have to police it for each other and for ourselves. So, you know, we have to work together to do that because they're, you know, they're just in it for the money. They're not, they don't care about any of that. Thank you, Mary Beth. Okay, um, moving on, do you create and sell items at different price points to reach a wider market? And so we actually kind of touched on this, Christy, you were discussing earlier. You were, in fact, you've been working on your little purses there that you sell for $45. Um, and, you know, that's kind of one of your lower end things. Uh, Mary Beth, you do the same thing as well, right? Because you're, you know, it, because as a native artist, you know, a lot of times, you know, we kind of hear that question, who's your target audience? And it's actually okay if you have different audiences that you're selling to. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if I, uh, I got to think of the politically correct way to say this. Um, so I have found that with my artwork personally, because I do a lot of wildlife, um, I do, you know, add some native com components to a lot of it, but not all of it. Um, so it seems like my personal, the collectors um, are not just native art collectors, um, but they're wildlife collectors. So they, they aren't necessarily native or, you know, into native art. So if I took just all of my wildlife art to say a powwow or something like that, all of my originals and things. So I'm not going to do very well. Right. But, you know, we, like I said, we've just learned on, on what we take and, and what does well at these, of course, we've been doing it for a while. So you just, if you're going to do, um, especially the competitive shows, things like that to where you go and set up a booth and if you're going to continue to do that, you'll learn. I mean, it just takes a little while on what what your audience is there and and what they like. So because it's funny, I mean, we have gone to some shows and it, and it'll be native art shows, and everybody, you know, at this one show will just be all about like John's native humor pieces. You know, and it's like, that's the big thing at that show. And then the next show we'll go to will be all about like my birds or something. I mean, you just don't ever know. It's just different. So you just have to, to learn where you're going and who you're selling to. Teresa, Christy or Bud, do any of you have any additional comments on, on this? And Teresa, I'm actually curious. So we know that Chris and Mary Beth do have products that they make that are at a much lower price point. Do you have any, do you do that with your baskets? I, I do. I do make smaller pieces. So basically, yeah, for us, um, especially with the um, ash trees being severely endangered, you know, there's a, there's a, due to climate change, the emerald ash borer beetle is killing all of the trees that we use in our weaving. And it's this like scourge, you know, and so the ash is so rare now and just a few guys really, you know, who get it and pound, you know, the ash logs with the blunt end of an ax and, you know, pretty much 
this has been a part of this 200 year economy too. you know, sell it to the basket makers and also harvesting our own sweet grass at the coast of Maine due to climate change and saltwater intrusion and uh, sweet grass beds are smaller now. And so there's all those considerations. <laughs> so even though I'm making smaller baskets, even those are more expensive, but I do try to have a range of sizes and prices. For the markets, particularly thinking about that with Santa Fe and the inflation thinking, you know, even though I need to have some bigger pieces for the competition, you just try to have to diversify in the size range is how, how we do it in the basketry pretty much. And Mr. Johnson, I see that you're back. You were gone a minute ago when I first posed the question. So I'll just ask it. Um, again, do you create any likes? Do you have different products at different price points? So you may have some pipes that are, you know, very expensive. Do you create any items on the lower end for different markets? Was that for me? It is. Yeah, we've got stuff. Uh, we make little pipe stone necklaces. We sell them for like $10 a piece. Uh, my wife, like, one of the ladies was just saying, we grow our own sweet grass. So we've got that for making baskets. She does a lot of that stuff. Pine needle baskets. Uh, she has a hard time with because she needs the longer pine needles. We don't grow them up in this area. So we have to have somebody down in the Carolinas send us some. And if they don't have any, we're SOL, kind of like the ash trees. Up north, I'm from up in northern Wisconsin. The ash trees have been doing really well until recently, and now this ash borer is kicking that apart. So a couple of our members do the ash baskets, and they're finding a hard time getting the ash logs to pound on to get the strips. But we've got a lot of smaller items in our store and on our website. So if people only want to buy well, like a little pipe. I think we've got some that are like $60 and we've got some that are $6,000. So somewhere in between, you ought to be able to find something that you like. Uh, yeah, and it's such a shame about the trees. I know here in Oklahoma, I have four pine trees in my yard. Three are d dead <laughs> now because of um, uh, similar issues. It's it's really a shame to see. Christy, did you did you raise your hand? You're very small on my screen at the moment, so you may have to just. Yeah, I actually um, I have an ash tree in my yard, and it's going great. And we don't really have those bugs because I live in an island, and they'd have to cross salt water. So if you guys want to send your trees up here to grow, we don't have any bugs. So you know, <laughs> it's not that big of a tree. It's probably a six inch in diameter, but it's a nice tree, and it's. A Definitely an ash. I think it's a black ash, I think, or something like that. I had it kind of scientific in Katsura. And of course, we get so much rain here, we have trees growing out our butt. So, right. I mean, hey, maybe you need to start another business and grow some of the trees uh, for materials that other people need. <laughs> I have trees growing out of my car because there's so many trees, so much water and moss and everything. We're just covered. So yeah, we really want an ash tree. I got I was gonna cut it down because it's it's in the way. So anybody want the ash stuff, let me know. I'll just ship it to you. Thanks, Christy. Um we did actually have a question come through and I just have kind of saved it, saved it till the end in case we didn't have time, but it looks like we've got some time to talk about it. And that is on uh, certificates of authenticity. I know this again, it's going off the topic of pricing, but um, curious to know what you guys think about offering certificates of authenticity with your work and maybe some different examples that you've seen and you know what some of the pros and cons to that might be. And I'm just going to open it up to which, you know, whoever would, would like to talk on that. I know some artists that do it, and I think it's awesome if you have the time and the ink and the, you know, I mean, 
if you want to do that. I've I've never done it. I maybe I should, but I put a bio with my piece and a business card, and that's my signatures on it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm kind of, I guess I'm kind of weird. I don't think I've made you do it yet. I guess because I see you often enough that one of these days I, I probably will. But, you know, I've purchased some, uh, some baskets and different things from other members in our tribe and have asked, can I please take a picture of you holding this uh, basket or this piece of art just so I can have it for... <laughs> For authenticity purposes, you know, because I treasure this stuff and I want to pass it on down to my family and I want them to know this is definitely who who made it and and who this person was. We yeah. have definitely had those in, in our group in in Maine for and it even said that this person certifies as a member of one of the federally recognized tribes. And, you know, it, for us, it was really good, too, because. It was all about, you know, as, as Christy has said a number of times, like, not only getting our names out there, but even the fact that this tradition existed, you know, when we first started in the Western markets and things, people were saying, oh, I've never heard of your tribe. It's always funny to me because people say they have a hard time saying my tribe, Penobscot, but they can say Passamaquoddy, which is, <laughs> to me, I, I mean, the spelling is is even tricky on that one. But um, yeah, so that that has really helped us. And it's kind of something too that I learned about when I was with the, um, I, I actually went to Switzerland to an intellectual property convening with um, um, thanks partially to Susan Anthony and Ken Van Way for helping you know me to find the application and everything, but it was an indigenous women's entrepreneurial training for intellectual property rights a couple of, uh, almost three years ago now. And that was one of the things we learned about too. It's really important for like this, almost our region is like a geographic region and a geographic indicator. So we even thought about, or still thinking about together, like, you know, a mark that, that represents all of us. I, I do have my own trademark now, a copyrighted symbol that I came up with for, as a result of that project, which is really cool. But also even to show that together, you know, as this alliance of basket makers, these Wabanaki tribes in Maine, that our work is authentic. Because the, the collectors really do look for that too. Well, and how could that certificate of authenticity um, help the artist in regards to pricing? Do you think it would help yeah. to make that piece worth more? And it's providing. Yeah, I, I think it. I, I do think it distinguished ourselves because we do have some, you know, non-native members out there too, you know, <laughs> making our baskets and, you know, all these like problematic things that everybody's experienced. And so, you know, they want to be sure that the piece is authentic. And so the price is higher generally because it's based on a, you know, hundreds, thousands of year old tradition versus other people who are, you know, taking our intellectual property and, you know, using it. And Christy, I saw you unmute. Were you going to to say add something? Yeah, we have a lot we have the silver hand project where it's basically recognizing that the native. And you can get these stickers to put on stuff we charge you a hundred dollars a year. I'm not, not sure how how much or how if they're left after Funding was cut for the arts. A lot of that went away, but um, it allows a person. But they didn't advertise a lot, you know, for what people should be looking for for authenticity. So we get so many tourists up here, and they don't advertise the silver hand project anymore as much as we used to. So it kind of went to the wayside, and. Uh, of course, a lot of people here in the you know, tourist industry, with the, you know, five ships a day come in, you know, dumping 9,000 people in their town. You know, they're all just looking to buy anything that looks native. So they don't care if it was made by anyone. They just want the trinkets. They may have been to Alaska. So we have a lot of competition with this foreign stuff and totems that made from here. And, and you, you really do try to be distinguished. So the bio, you know, the 
website, try to be as authentic as possible with what we, the tools we have. So, you know, history. Oh, Christy. Um, I have been trying to pay attention to the chat, everyone. It's it's a little bit difficult when you're moderating. So I'm sure there's probably some questions that I have missed. And if I have, you're welcome to chat them back in. And Susan Anthony, you can help me monitor that. I do see a question here from Debbie Franklin, uh, Mary Beth, that's directed towards you. And she asked, do you participate in wildlife art shows in addition to um, shows that are native focused? Um, the only one that I have participated in is um, pretty local here in Tulsa, and it's because we help support this wildlife rescue, um, and they do a show called Wild at Art, and so the money um, that's like that we pay for our booth fee um, goes towards helping that um, rescue. And then they have all kinds of stuff going on during that show also that helps fund that. So, um, but yeah, that's the only one that I have done. I would love to do the big one that, that comes to Tulsa Nature Works. Oh my gosh, I know there's a huge waiting list for that one. But, but no, I haven't. I should, I guess. But since, you know, the thing about shifting to um, mostly online now and doing our, I shouldn't say shifting to online, but doing our business part of it to where we print our images onto items and because we do wholesale and we stay so busy doing that, that I really don't have a lot of time to create a lot of new works. Oh, and also since the pandemic, I started illustrating books. And so between the two, I, yeah, I just haven't had a lot of time to do much on, on new pieces anyway. Christine, did you want to, did you want to comment? On um, Question. I, I just saw you. I'm sorry. I just saw you unmute and it highlights you. Um, and so I thought you were getting ready to want to um, say something. Well, we have uh, just about 15 minutes before we end. So I really kind of want to close out, you know, since again, the this whole webinar series is really about helping native artists learn how to expand their business through e commerce. What advice each of you would give someone who is considering using e-commerce to sell their work? And if it's easier, um, I can just call on call on you individually. But. I, I was just going to say, you know, something that really helped me a lot was just to look around at other artists that you really admire and see what they're doing, you know? And a lot of times too, I mean, we're talking about competitors before that, you know, the work I've done with First People's Fund and here we are sharing here as well. You know, you, you, you're more apt to find other native artists who wanna share like their methodology and their successes and sort of the trial and error thing. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel yourself. So that's what I would recommend is looking around um, at other people in your genre and see how they're doing their marketing and ask them for some tips and advice. Oh, that's great. And, you know, Mary Beth, that's exactly what you do. You actually teach Etsy entrepreneurship classes to other native artists, um, you know, so that way if, if someone is interested in starting an Etsy store, they have one and it's not really working right, you're somebody that they can reach out as a resource to. So uh, good point right. there, Teresa. And and what I was going to say is that, you know, whenever I very first started doing it, you know, there's so many artists out there like me that that are more, I, what I always tell everybody, you know, when they talk about business and numbers and everything, and I'm like, my head is full of lots of pretty colors, but not a lot of like business stuff. So, um, so I did have to ask for 
help, you know, with different things because there were some things that just were too much. I mean, it was just too much information and kind of overwhelmed me because I was busy with other things, my mind on different things and trying to create. And then, you know, then we have this trying to, you know, do all this online stuff. And so what I would say is don't let it overwhelm you and don't be afraid to ask for help because there there's plenty of help out there, whether it's us, you know, if you have a tribal commerce, um, you know, or artist friends, or, you know, I don't know if you have local SBDs, small business development um, programs, or, you know, women's business programs. There, There's so much help out there. Just don't be afraid to reach out and ask. Thank you, Mary Beth. And Christy, I think you hit on a really good point earlier, you know, on the importance of having a website. So, um, if you are going to have that online presence, even if it is just an Etsy store, don't you feel that having the website is also just kind of an important component to serve as a hub for those places? Yeah, and the hardest thing is trying to figure out what to put on the website, what's the most pertinent stuff. And what I found out was if you don't know, ask your customers. They'll tell you what they want to see. And don't be afraid to ask the customer, should I put this first? Or what do you want to know about me? What's the most important thing that you want to see? Do you want to see the product first? Do you want to see me hunting? Do you want to see, you know, what it is, what it takes for me to do it? Do you want the action? What is it? So I've actually had a lot of customers write back in saying, I'd really like to see this, or can you show more photos of this? Or, you know, I didn't know you won awards. Where is that page at? So my website went from two pages to 12 pages now. And don't don't hesitate on just keep filling it up because some people do read the actual web page more than past the second page. But so. it's okay to start out with a website that has just one or two pages, right? I mean, yeah. it doesn't have to be yeah. anything. Fancy. I had one with no shopping cart, no nothing. It was just two pages and still people got to see who I was. The other thing that's really important is do your SEO if it's possible through your web web browser, web stuff. Go on Google um, and do the and Google Analytics so then you can you know register your shop with Google and it takes a while and write your SEO, search engine optimization codes and keywords. Make sure to get those done. If you're unique, you need to have your keywords saying exactly what you do so then people can find you. It takes about three years to get established, but start early. Even on Etsy, you know, the keywords, very important. So, and also get, make sure to have a website that leaves reviews. Then you can, somebody can leave a review about your merchandise. Those people, when they read the reviews, those are the people that write the best things about you or the worst things. But the best thing about you, and they will start, they will promote more buying from other customers, the trust that you want. And you do need to have the bad ones on there too, because you know, not everybody's rosy. So right. You saying something, Teresa? Oh, okay. Okay. Guess I, I just think guessed. with with um with our website, it's mainly like a portfolio type thing, you know, where you have your images and everything. And then um, we have, um, like Christy was saying, we have a page that tells, you know, like all of our accolades and, and awards and things. And then it ties our Etsy store. Actually, there's a link on our website to shop and it goes directly to our Etsy shop. So. That's how we, and also, you know, we use ours because, and of course I say this and I haven't done it in a few months, but we were doing a monthly newsletter for collectors and, and um, gift shops, galleries, things like that, um, to where, you know, as soon as they go on the website, there's a pop-up that says you can sign up to get our, you know, monthly newsletter and keep up with, you know, if we have shows going on or, 
you know, any specials or new images or new products, things like that. And I give them like a coupon on there if they sign up. So. I think the next thing I want to do is actually do a pop up. Pop up shop where you can actually just. You have one person read all the comments and you can show you what you're making and say it's for sale. And they can go directly to the website and then purchase that right then and there. So, you can be gone. so I'd love to do a pop up shot, live pop up shot sometime. I need two extra people working. Yeah, so. that's what we're talking about doing too, because we, we're finishing our studio right now behind our house. And I'm going to have it set up and do a little online art show, um, live art show on there. And, so and don't forget in your shop to have a little settee with tea and crackers and stuff and everything. You gotta have the tea. People little tiny couch. That's what I got in my back here. You gotta have a place for people to sit and just shoot the breeze and pet pet stuff or look at stuff. Some do book cards, postcards, and they feel comfortable. You gotta right. have the tea. Very good. Oh, um, something also I was going to say, um, something that we offer now for like, whether it be collectors or galleries or gift shops, whatever is, you know, especially since COVID happened. And so almost everybody knows how to do zoom, you know, or, you know, something like this. So we offer that to our customers if, because we don't have a brick and mortar, right? And so some want to look at what you might have on hand so you know i'll i'll offer to have do a zoom call with them and so we can do that i can share my screen and show them what we have available instead of just texting them pictures or emailing them pictures that way you have a face-to-face -face and you can communicate with them there just like if you were in person so you know people might consider that as well yeah, thank you that's the way to go Well, um, I want to say, Wado, thank all of you for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure, and it's always so great getting to actually talk um, and hear the experience of other Native artists. So I see Ken is back on camera, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Ken now so he could close out, and I hope you all have a good rest of your day. All right. Yeah, I'd like to join Lynn in thanking everybody for participating, all of our speakers. I would like to thank all of our attendees and, of course, all our future viewers. who are going to catch this on a, a delayed broadcast. Uh, I guess there are a couple things that, that came up during the course of this that I wanted to, to touch on. Uh, Teresa had mentioned the, the IP work that she had done and about the, the branding and the working with the tribes. And Susan and I are, are still very interested in working with that just because we've been isolated recently for whatever reason. And if people would like to reach out to us, you, you can uh, contact uh, me through the Indian Arts and Crafts Board or Susan and I through the, the contact information here at the USPTO. As far as some of the issues with ivory and sea otter products and the sale and the different laws, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board has two brochures that you can find through our website, www.doi.gov slash IACB. Uh, if you go into our publications, we do have a publication about Alaska Native walrus ivory products and a brochure about Alaska Native sea otter products that explains some of the legal issues a little bit better and about why you can actually have them uh, in most cases. So feel free to, to check those out. And I would like to invite everyone to attend, uh, register, visit us on July 14th for our, our next webinar, which is going to be on marketing plans. And in addition to marketing plans, we also hope to have an expert in on that to talk to us about shipping costs as a bonus, because I know people had mentioned that in the past and we do try to be responsive. So I guess that's it for today. I would like to again, thank all of our speakers. You did a wonderful job. Thank Lynn and Susan and Mark and everybody who's worked behind the scenes to make this a, a workable project. and. That's it.
Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having me.